respect every single Spider-Man in here. Does that include? Yes. I'm a certified Spider-Verse meat writer. I've sung the movie praises multiple times on this channel, and... <laughs> I'll fucking do it again. Okay, it was a monumental leap for the superhero genre and medium of animation. Spider-Verse was a breath of fresh air in an industry which had stagnated over the years, and it remains influential to this day. So saying the sequel had big shoes to fill would be an understatement. I try not to go into things with any kind of expectations, but I'd be lying to you if I said that I didn't have any with Across the Spider-Verse. And somehow it still managed to blow every one of those expectations out of the water. Every frame is breathtaking, the characters are phenomenal, and the music... Look, I know we're only halfway through 2023, but I'm calling it right now. This is the movie of the year. And it's not just me. Everyone seems to love this sequel. Um, hey, actually, I don't really like... Everyone seems to love this sequel. But if there's one complaint that I keep hearing about the movie, it's that it's incomplete. It ends on a cliffhanger and doesn't give the audience any meaningful payoff to everything that's been built up throughout the course of its 140 minute runtime. Back in 2021, screenwriters Lord and Miller revealed that the story they wanted to tell for Across the Spider-Verse was too much for one movie. So it was split up into this film and the upcoming Beyond the Spider-Verse. It wasn't meant to be a trilogy. The second and third entries are just two halves of what was originally one film. So how can either one be considered complete? While I do agree that even in a trilogy, each movie should feel like a full package, I think the way that they handled splitting this sequel gave it more than enough for it to stand on its own two feet. The ending left me wanting more, but I didn't feel blue-balled by it, which I think is the best kind of cliffhanger. The narrative threads laid out from the start of the movie were wrapped up by the end, and all the questions I had were answered. Now you might say that the conflict with the main villain was never resolved, but the spot isn't the main villain of Across the Spider-Verse. From the opening moment with Miles, the primary conflict of the film is established. He's been New York's one and only Spider-Man for the past year, but he's still a long way from having everything figured out. He's stuck between two worlds, the first of which he doesn't have anyone he can talk to about, and the other one where he's never on the same page with those closest to him. While doing his superhero thing, we see that he's also running late to a meeting with his parents and a guidance counselor to talk about his future. Not what he wants to do with his future, but what's best for him, or at least what those in positions of leadership perceive to be best for him. In this meeting, Miles' internal conflict is laid bare. He has his own goals and desires, but everyone tries to push him on a predetermined path without any concern for what he wants to do. Despite their best intentions, they only push Miles further away. He tries talking to his mom as Miles Morales, but still can't bridge the gap between them. He has a candid heart-to-heart -heart with his dad as Spider-Man, but with the mask between them, how personal can the conversation really be? When Miles expresses that he wants to tell his parents about his side hustle as a masked vigilante, Gwen says that it's better not to. Not every Spider-Man has all this. He can be both Miles and Spider-Man. She doesn't consider his situation and is clearly lamenting the fact that she can't go back to her life as Gwen Stacy after what happened in her universe. Gwen deals with a similar conflict to Miles throughout the film. Her identity as normal teenager Gwen Stacy and superhero Spider-Woman are at odds with each other. Both are part of who she is, but only one is accepted by her father. She sees him as a good cop, but not so much as the best dad. And when he rejects that other part of her, she decides to leave the Gwen Stacy identity behind and solely be Spider-Woman. A decision that she wishes she had never been forced to make. She wishes she could go back and prescribes the same thing to Miles' situation. She also tries to keep him from the rest of the Spider Society. Another decision that was made four miles with no input from him. Everything comes to a head when Black Spider-Man meets Black Air Force Spider-Man, aka the primary antagonist of the film, aka Miguel O'Hara. Miguel is everything the movie had been building up to. He values function over form and created the Spider Society to uphold what he believes is right. Miles is someone who goes against the grain. Miguel perceives him as an anomaly, a glitch in the system, something that shouldn't be. Miles stands against everything he built, making Miguel the perfect foil to the protagonist. He may be cold and utilitarian, but like everyone else trying to put Miles on a predetermined path, he's still well-intentioned. He's not an evil, irredeemable villain, but a physical representation of what Miles had been struggling with throughout the film. After the climactic 1v1000 spider battle, Miles concludes his character arc by delivering the coldest line in the movie. Everyone keeps telling me how my story is supposed to go. Nah, I'm 
I'm gonna do my own thing. If this isn't the climax of the movie, then I don't know what is. I, I was in that movie theater climaxing myself. If the first film was about Miles becoming Spider-Man, then this movie is about him finding his footing as both Miles Morales and Spider-Man. Him deciding to write his own story instead of following the established canon that everyone expects him to. Something that nicely ties back to one of the major themes of the first movie, expectations. His very inception as Spider-Man was something that happened against all odds and now he plans to save his dad and the universe against all odds. Breaking the canon is basically his M.O. He even does the big superhero no-no. Miles breaks the barrier between his two identities and reveals to his mom that he is, in fact, black. Gwen's conflict is resolved with her reconciling with her dad and finding out that she doesn't just have to accept what's canon. She can carve her own path, and she leaves to go help Miles do just that. These are complete character arcs. I've also heard some complaints that the movie spends too much time in the first act on the teen drama, but that's exactly what's at the heart of this story. The struggles these characters face are front and center, and everything else is used as a vehicle to explore that, and this is especially true for The Spot. The Spot doesn't really function as a villain in this movie, but more so as a catalyst to drive the narrative forward, and he plays that role perfectly. It's thanks to him that Miles is even Spider-Man in the first place. He's why Gwen came to Miles' universe, why they both went to Mumbatton, why a canon event was broken there, why Miles got this intervention, and why Miles is on his way to make a canon-breaking hat trick. He does all of this while taking a backseat throughout most of the movie. He really isn't given that much screen time. If the movie were to be 20 minutes longer and we saw Miles reach his home universe and beat the spot, I don't think the movie would have been any better for it. It wouldn't feel earned because that's not what was being built up throughout the movie. We already got two extremely cathartic scenes with our main leads, and anything after that was extra. The Spot was grinding side quests off screen trying to make himself live up to the self-proclaimed title of Spider-Man's nemesis, and that's something for the next movie to explore. The same goes for Miles' evil twin. He was a character who was mentioned a few times but only really introduced in the last few minutes. The way I see the ending is not loose ends that weren't tied up, but crumbs being dropped at the end of a complete film to keep us hungry for the next one. And let me tell you bro, I'm starving. And if the main complaint with the movie is wanting more of that movie, then that's a damn good movie. That's it for this video. See y'all in the next one.